Welcome back everyone and thanks for being here. The next panel is typically the most popular panel of any of the panels that we have, the sessions that we have. This is one is on cyber insurance, except just about ransomware and cyber insurance. And we've got a terrific team of all stars to talk to you today. Let's get right to these introductions so they can get going. So many of us here share the common thread, those attending this conference and speakers, of not just being legal or compliance professionals, but also entrepreneurs, because we're creating a practice area that has only recently experienced its genesis. But very few people here have taken that notion of entrepreneurialism to its highest level. That is, except for our next panelist, Jennifer Coughlin, a partner and the founder of Mullen Coughlin, a law firm exclusively dedicated to cyber. Jennifer is the Steve Jobs of IR. What makes Jennifer a cyber expert is not just her extraordinary expertise providing first party breach response and third party privacy de defense services, not just that, but it's also that cyber related work is all her firm does. She is an extraordinary success and should be an inspiration to any of us, uh, especially the newer practitioners out there, at just how far your expertise can take you if you have the will. Welcome, Jennifer, and thanks for moderating today. Thanks, John. Next up is Heather Sussman. She is global co-chair of Oryx Cyber Privacy and Data Innovation Practice and the leader of Oryx Boston office. Heather Sussman, to me, is the Serena Williams of data privacy. What makes Heather a cyber expert is not just the almost 20 years of experience she has and the incredible level of experience she has amid such a complex and evolving landscape, because these privacy laws change every year, but it's also that Heather thrives when she's taking on an issue of first impression. When COVID-19 first hit, Heather got to thinking about the data-related challenges of work from home and quickly put together a compendium of U.S. data privacy and security laws, standards, and frameworks implicated by remote work arrangements, creating the kind of legal compliance guide that so many of us look to every day. There is no stopping Heather Sussman. Heather, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. This is going to be a lot of fun. Excellent. Next up is Scott Goddess the co-chair of the Data Privacy and Security Practice at Barnes Thornburg. Now, what Steph Curry did for the three-point shot, Scott Goddess has done in the field of cyber insurance, perfecting the practice area as an art form. What makes Scott a cyber expert is not just that he argued two appeals on behalf of insured companies against insurance companies who deny charges, both in the 11th Circuit on behalf of the insured after the data insecure, one he won and one settled, which means in my view, just my view, he won both. But it's also, this is the greatest thing about Scott. He handled these cases from start to finish. He didn't pass either case along to one of his appellant specialist colleagues. He did the appellant arguments himself, the circuit court arguments. Like so many of our panelists, Scott's skill set stretches across multiple disciplines and he was fired up enough to just take on that challenge. So welcome, Scott. Thanks for Thanks, being John. here. John. Always great to be here. Excellent. Our next two panelists look at ransomware from a different lens than the rest of us. As I said, this is a very popular panel. And one of the comments we always had was that we need people from the insurance industry on the panel, not just lawyers talking about it. So starting with uh, Adam, first, Arnett is the National Cyber Risk Practice Leader at Acresure. Uh, Adam Abresh is responsible for designing custom cyber crime and technology solutions for across the globe. And Adam is a real communication specialist. And what makes Adam perfect for this panel is not just that he's a guest lecturer at Fordham, Hofstra, and that he leads cyber liability education for over mm -hmm. 250 AcraSure partner agencies throughout the country. But it's also that Adam is of the school that cyber insurance agencies should be helping clients understand what to do when a breach happens and walking through that process ahead of time, ushering his version of a new paradigm into the cyber insurance arena. I love this concept. I love it, Adam, because I'm tired of fighting with insurance companies. So welcome, Adam. Welcome to me. And thanks for being here. Thanks, John. Excellent. And then next up is Michael Phillips, my friend, a chief claims officer at Resilience, helping clients manage insurance during the entire life cycle of a data breach. Michael's value proposition is not just as an experienced cyber insurance expert who also worked managing claims at Allianz and Beasley, uh, who specialized in pre breach services, but it's also that Michael is a key player, perhaps the most key player in a ransomware response in helping assess the threat, not just on whether payment will work out, but also whether payment will result in uh, any sort of liability or even a prison term for the payers of the ransom. 
as opposed to the recipient. And that shows you the upside down world of data breaches. It's not an easy role to play, but guess what? Michael loves it. He just loves it. So welcome, Michael. Welcome, Adam, all of you. Great to have this panel. Jennifer, I'm going to turn it over to you and look forward to listening to what you have to say. Great. Thanks, John. Hi, everybody. So this is a great forum on ransomware that is happening already that will continue throughout the day, but you can't have a complete conversation on the ransomware epidemic without discussing the important role of cyber insurance. So we only have 15 minutes. We're going to get going right away. First, I want to talk about the proliferation and evolution of ransomware from each of the panelists' perspective. So Adam, from a broker's perspective, I'd love to hear it from you first. Sure. Um, and, you know, I think as I look back, you know, a few years, even even two years ago, right, we we're talking about ransomware. But I think you know, within the industry, everybody was talking about ransomware. But at a client level, right, especially when you got to the small and mid-sized businesses, it was kind of this abstract idea. And I think the big evolution is that this has become real for more people. More people have experienced it. They've seen what it looks like when it actually hits their company. And now they're starting to ask more questions about cyber insurance, right? Because cyber insurance is kind of this nebulous term. And a lot of people, from my experience, don't even know what to make of it. I right? mean, they think of insurance, they think of, oh, I'm insuring a building. And that's something concrete they can kind of wrap their mind around. But I'm insuring cyber, what does that even mean? And then now it gets into ransomware. Like first you need to explain what exactly that is what the implications are of it, and then what that can ultimately cost a business, right? So I think the evolution that I've seen is there's been a tremendous amount of education from our agency out to the client level. And now the clients are really starting to understand what it means, right, to their business. If you get hit with ransomware, here's what happens, right? It's not, and if you do get hit with it, it's not something as simple as, oh, well, maybe it's a couple hundred bucks and we'll just pay it. I had another client was like, well, we'll just get new computers, right? It's not that simple. And so I think there's a better understanding on the client side now, and there's still an ongoing, continuing, you know, discussion that takes place. So it's been, a, it's been an exciting thing to watch from my perspective. And I've been able to engage with a lot of clients on this and help them figure out how to deal with this. Michael, how about from the carrier's perspective? Sure. And, uh, you know, Adam lays out the crisis really well, as do some of our prior, uh, the prior panels uh, here at the forum. Uh, you know, for cyber underwriters, the kaleidoscope really has been shaken. You know, the, the, the losses are more severe and the, the underwriters are in need of a reorientation towards the future. You know, we can't keep having the same conversations as a cyber risk industry that we have been having, as Adam was laying out for the last few years. You know, cyber underwriters should justly, in my view, be proud of standing with thousands of victim companies to make sure in their, in their time of crisis that they, that they have the backstop of insurance to recover. But that's the beginning of the conversation for 2021 and, and beyond. Uh, underwriters today are taking a fresh and more comprehensive, more sophisticated look at assessing the risk, pricing the risk, hand handling the claim, certainly uh, my favorite, as John was highlighting. But we really, the underwriting, um, the underwriting sector really has to seize the mantle again of both insuring and securing against risks, uh, just as we see, you know, Adam mentioned buildings, property underwriters, you know, imposing or influencing risk manage management uh, solutions. And that's where cyber uh, underwriting uh, is today. This is really fascinating moment where we're all trying to sort out what steps to make strategically to do that. Heather, how about from your perspective? Yes, I have a slightly different perspective. And I, I think it's, it, it's interesting because three or four years ago, I was speaking at this huge SIFMA conference in, in Florida. SIFMA is this leading trade association for financial services firms. And on my panel was the head of information security for Fidelity, State Street, and a few other financial institutions. And we polled the audience asking who's concerned about ransomware. And out of about 250 people in our session, only three people raised their hand, just three. So fast forward to, to today, and I think those numbers would probably be flipped. Um, but it just shows uh, how different and, and how much this has evolved. And it's not just a concern for companies' own data and their networks, but also that of the supply chain. So I wanted to touch just briefly on the latest, because, you know, this idea about trends, this latest that we're seeing in exploits 
and that they involve spear phishing. So where the threat actors have performed reconnaissance, they know who they want to go after in the business, they send an email with what we call macro malware, where the threat actors leverage a normal function of Microsoft Office, right? Macro malware was, was um, fairly common several years ago because macros ran automatically whenever a document was open. But in recent versions of, of Microsoft Office, those macros are disabled by default. So now the malware authors need to convince users to turn on the macros so that the malware can run. And they're really good at this, right? They, they need to scare users by showing fake warnings when a malicious document is opened. And if they're successful, the, the threat actor typically then installs PowerShell, some other executable, and they use credentials previously harvested in order to try to move laterally. So how do you fight against this? Because things like macros and PowerShell, these are all normal functions of the business that you would expect to see operating on your network in most cases. Um, but it's it's really tough. So, so I think the first the first idea is that you start with endpoint protection, right? Endpoint protection that includes behavioral monitoring and analysis, and that's a start, and these AI tools. And, and that detects anomalous and potentially malicious behavior. Um, of course, you know, this malicious activity is designed to mimic normal activity, so it's, it's tough to detect. And that's why I think you need these latest, most advanced tools to alert, so you know, and the people to triage those alerts to make sure you're not missing the red flags. And I also wanted to mention in terms of trends, Jennifer, that we used to just see ransomware, of course, but we're increasingly seeing data exfiltration. And in my most recent case, the threat actor actually said, yeah, we could have deployed ransomware, but we decided just to take your data because it was so easy. They figured out that with data exfiltration, companies seem more willing to pay to get that back. And the problem is that while there used to be honor among thieves where you pay the extortion demand to get your data back, that's not always the case now. And some threat actors are using it like an annuity. They say they'll delete your data if you pay them, but they may not. And you might hear from them weeks or even months later looking for more money. Their strategy considerations, of course, in the do I pay or do I not pay question, it's really impossible to give a simple playbook. Sometimes paying buys you critical time to do work you may need to do to shore up your systems if there's an ongoing threat or an active exploit. It may depend on the level of sensitivity of the information in the proof of life set, for example or that, that was on the servers that you believe were impacted. So what's interesting here from the insurance context is I think that carriers really take a widely diverging uh, position on this. Some carriers want to be right in the thick of the negotiation, authorizing an, a, a payment amount each step of the way. Others really define parameters, leave it to the company. So my takeaway for insureds is to let is to know what you're buying, right? In addition to understanding rates and limits and retention, what's covered, it's important to also know who are you going to be dealing with. And on, on the claim side, carrier and are they typically reasonable, partnerly cooperative? I know my panel colleagues will say, absolutely, we always are. But, you know, I think th there is a diverging uh, approach to that in the market. And so I think part of shopping for your insurance is really understanding that profile of the carrier. To be totally candid, I'm not so sure that all brokers always clearly spell out those considerations when companies are looking to buy coverage. I've seen lots of charts breaking out the different terms, but not necessarily that kind of behind the scenes color commentary. So, you know, that, that raises the issue, I think, from a perspective of the carriers that are from the brokers and the carriers, this, this idea of, you know, there's a, a symbiotic relationship there, potentially, um, you know, uh, I, I wonder how that affects the ability to, to put clients first, clients' interests first. We see that also on the panel council side, right? I've, I've had carriers say to me where, you know, I've never been denied a copy of this forensic report. And so thinking about, um, how to select your counsel also in the context of the incident response is really critical. Um, I, I do find it surprising that the, the, in, the forensic report issue and the privilege issue is raised a lot. And Scott, I know that, that that issue comes up a lot in the coverage context when you're dealing with those issues too. Yeah, and Scott, I think you've seen an evolution of ransomware generally from your perspective as well. And I know organizations ask for your assistance when they're determining should they buy cyber insurance and what should they be looking for and thinking about. So from your perspective, what have you seen the evolution involved? So it's a great question. Um, the, from the perspective of both uh, the buying and the claim side, and let's talk about the claim side first, which is where the bread and butter of this comes down. Uh, the claim side this is happening Everybody knows, so I'm not saying anything new, more frequently and more, uh, with more severity. So what does that mean? Well, look at the history of anything insurance. I know everyone's fascinated about that, but any large group of claims like asbestos, the first asbestos claims were covered in full, the carriers worked together, then, oh my God, it got super expensive. 
And then so law firms made an entire living off of litigating whether asbestos claims were covered. Ransomware, the first ones I saw, people were stepping up, paying the ransom pretty handily. The amounts were not huge. You then convert the ransoms into seven, eight figures, and all of a sudden, the claim is not being handled by an internal person. It's probably an attorney anyway. But then you get a situation in which the claim is being handled by outside counsel, and perhaps they have a more aggressive view of things. Maybe they don't, but the ones I see, they do. And so it, it's, there's been more pressure and more questions about, was this reasonable? Did you act appropriately? And then on the front end of things, it's worthwhile because of the severity of these events, giving some more thought to what does your policy say and do I have the people lined up that I like? If you've got a law firm that you really like, is that law firm a firm that the carrier will agree to? If you've got outside vendors, if you've done tabletops with name your vendor of choice, are they going to be someone that's that's uh, a firm that's admitted and, and permissible under the policy. And, and those are things that are pretty commonly raised in terms of cyber insurance when evaluating both the policy, the claims, but with the severity that I've been seeing, it just, it gets crystallized a lot more quickly and it becomes a more difficult problem for people. And so that's when I get called in. But as I like to tell people, for the easy ones, I don't get called and no one calls me up and says, hey, I want to pay you uh, hundreds of dollars per hour, which you're 100% worth, just to ride herd on a claim that's going great. The carrier's paying everything, so can you just supervise and we want to pay you for that? No, it's, it's the ones that, that get messy. But ideally, I get called in, and it happens sometimes. I get called in early enough where we walk through some of the issues and, and a lot of things go a lot more smoothly than originally planned without sort of advising about how the policy works. If I could, uh, yeah, Jennifer, uh, did you want to step in? No, I was actually going to turn it over to you to talk a little bit more. You know, cyber insurance hasn't been around for that long when you think about it in the grand scheme of insurance, yet you've seen a lot of evolution. And I think the current stats is that the market's not really penetrated right now. So you're going to see more organizations purchasing it, more losses, but even more evolution as well, because you've got the evolution of the insurance and the coverage and the evolution of the cyber threats. So from your perspective, I'd love to hear more about the evolution of the insurance piece. Sure. And, and taking Scott's comments and yours both and just building on them, you know, one thing for this audience that I want to really highlight, which I think sometimes is a uh, misconception in the industry, is um, whether ransomware claims are being paid and covered and in what ways are they being covered. Um, so, you know, some of Scott's comments, I would bracket them with respect to the, the silent cyber issue, which I think underwriters have been uh, very proactive in, uh, in curing, perhaps Scott uh, being on the other side of the aisle often for me may disagree. But the, what that means is uh, non-cyber policies, not affirmative cyber uh, branded at the top, cyber expertise, uh, property policies, CGL policies, things like that, um, whether there was a cyber coverage uh, in them or not, that question, and wrestling with that question. You know, so, but to bracket that conversation, and, and I'm a cyber insurance specialist, as is our firm and our underwriters, and I speak, speak on their behalf, um, you know, we are also responding to some of the things that have been talked about earlier uh, in this in this great forum, such as the increased regulatory attention to ransom payments uh, in particular, and the ransomware epidemic in the abstract. So when the OFAC and FinCEN advisories come down, you know, uh, the insurance sector can't uh, ignore those, uh, even um, even in the face of some of this high pressure uh, ransom loss. Michael, I think to your point, in terms of the silent cyber for the non-insurance nerds in the room, um, that's conceptually, that's the idea of, is there insurance for cyber risks outside of a cyber insurance policy? And I used to bang on the table at, at events you know, back in 2008, 2009, uh, when John Mullen and Ted Kobus were just getting their practices rolling and uh, now they're titans of the industry. And and I would say, yeah, I think that there is insurance for these risks outside of a cyber insurance policy. And someone called me, you're like the poor, you're like the skunk underneath the porch at a garden party. What are you doing here? Which <laughs> I, I suppose I took as a compliment. But But what I have found is that there are arguments to be made about coverage under other policies other than cyber. But the perhaps the most uh, perplexing one is when you have a policy that affirmatively covers ransomware event, that's not a cyber insurance policy. More specifically, 
a kidnap ransom and extortion policy. And I have found that those carriers, notwithstanding the fact that there is affirmative coverage written, they, they are, um, they, they make my life challenging. Perhaps they'll come around and they'll pay the ransom, if, but there will be an argument that they'll make about, are they supposed to pay first or, or should cyber insurance pay first? And then for anything beyond the ransom, then they argue, well, that's not covered. Or if it is covered, our policy only applies during the window of time in which the ransom was in place. And even though everything is related to the event, arising out of the event, et cetera, they only have to pay for that 48-hour window, uh, making it a, a challenging conversation, not only between the carrier and the policyholder, but then between the policyholder and the other carriers, where the other carriers are saying, well, why isn't the KRE policy paying first? Why isn't crime paying first? And, and that means more plates to keep spinning and, and more people to talk to and try and figure out how do we get these costs covered? Yeah. And I just, I mean, kind of just something that I, I mean, I kind of the thread going through that and Heather, you mentioned it is just like a, a fundamental understanding of what it, what coverage you have, right? right? Like, okay, it's one thing. Okay. Yes. I have cyber coverage or no, I don't have cyber coverage. Right. So now you do. Okay. Let's say you do, right. Do you understand what's in there? And so I, you know, from my vantage point, part of what I do is obviously working with clients and placing business. But the other part of what I do is educating brokers on cyber insurance, right? There's a whole community of insurance brokers that have been brokering insurance that is not cyber insurance, that is not their core focus, right? And these are people that work in insurance every single day. And cyber insurance is different than all of those other insurance policies. And so... I, you know, I work on understanding what's, what's in these policies and breaking this down. And when you talk about, you know, Heather, I think you make a great point in terms of what's in here, right? Do you, it's, it's one thing to understand what the risk is and make a decision whether or not to cover something or whether or not to accept a certain level of risk. You know, like we were talking about coinsurance on ransomware before. It's one thing to understand that and know that it's there and accept that risk. It's entirely different if that's buried in the policy, nobody ever discloses it, right? Like, and that's on, you know, like that's on the broker to explain that to the client. Like, hey, this is, this is what could happen if this policy is in here. Yeah, it might be cheaper than that one, but understand what's there. Understand what these conditions look like. You know, understand what your responsibilities are as an insured when something happens. And I think that whole aspect of it is really something that you talk about, like the evolution. That's something that I think every day, whether in the brokerage community and, you know, working with clients, both, both of those angles, it's just, that's something that really has to take place so that people don't end up, you know, super upset when they have a claim and say, I thought I had this, isn't this what we were talking about? And that's what I, you know, that's my, I never want to get that call, right? That's, uh, that's my goal is to make sure those folks understand exactly what they have. And as outside counsel, when I'm coming in on an incident and I see that there are potential multiple insurances, first of all, I got to know what's in the policy. But the challenge of how those policies interact and respond to each other, at some point, I need to know when I'm supposed to bring in Scott, for example, as coverage counsel, because there are things that I may be doing in the process of advising the client and how to handle different aspects of the investigation, let alone communications with the carrier that actually may impact the ability to make a claim against another policy. And I won't necessarily know that because I'm not a coverage expert. Expert. And so I'm looking to Scott, for example, to help me make those, to understand the parameters and the bounds of what I'm doing. And I think that's, that's part of the responsibility of the service that I provide. Michael, why don't, you, why don't we dig a little deeper into exactly what you do see coverage for, standalone cyber, what you're seeing coverage for, types of conditions that you're seeing? Sure, across the marketplace, uh, you know, it's typical market standard, competitive uh, cyber policies are not, you know, one thing I want to highlight is that they're not just covering extortion payments. You know, I, yeah. even in a, even in sophisticated audiences like, like this one, um, I, I frequently get questions uh, along the lines of, you know, are you, is an insurance fueling this crisis? Aren't they just enforcing policyholders, you know, against their will to pay in, uh, ransoms that they don't want to pay? And, and nothing could be further from the truth on, on that. So a, t a typical uh, cyber policy is going to be covering for breach response costs you know, the kinds of uh, investigation, legal and uh, forensic to understand what's going on, specifically the ransomware uh, epidemic, you know, not just 
a cyber extortion payment coverage, but the loss coverage, you know, whether that is uh, cost to restore systems uh, from backups, uh, cost to, to um, restore systems through some other method, as well as the business interruption uh, loss that may result. So if a policyholder came to a uh, cyber market and said, look, we, we have a policy, we'd never pay a ransom uh, and we want to tender our loss as a result of this ransomware event. There are a whole host of coverages available uh, in the cyber insurance market today to uh, to help them restore their, their systems and get back up and running. And I think it'd be helpful to have this conversation in the context of an actual event. So, Heather, why don't you walk us through a, a ransomware event and sure. uh, the types of services that you are bringing in on behalf of your client? And then we can yep. talk with Scott and with Adam and Michael about how how that jives with the policy and some issues that we've seen. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier too, I think at the outset where an insurer is involved, I read the policy. I think I need to know what's covered, what's not, that can influence the steps I might take in the investigation when I need to get coverage counsel involved. And so I, I get it, we'll, we'll talk about that next. But an initial call with the adjuster or with the carrier to understand expectations is really key. How often are you giving updates? In what form? Is it weekly, bi-weekly? Is it daily calls, depending on the level of complexity of the incident? What's the pace and cadence for pre-approvals, right? It can differ depending on the carrier. And I think you need to retain your forensic provider through counsel, of course, but get that SOW approved by the carrier. So then in addition to your forensic provider, who you want to get down on the ground running, you're also then retaining your um, ransom negotiator or extortion demand negotiator. And you really want to turn your communications over to that professional negotiator for a number of different reasons. For ransomware, the, the idea is that you want to try to get your arms around quickly, the strategy considerations for the company? Can they restore from back backups? How quickly? What might be the fallout from that? If it's data exfiltration, what's in that data set? Is there a proof of life set? These people are, um, these, these ransom negotiators are quite impressive, actually. They do so many of these. They're able to also, um, you know, sort of take some of the intel that you provide to them and gain their own insight from the negotiation process that allows them to give a level of certainty on attribution. And I know at this conference, we're going to hear a lot about that issue of attribution. I do think that a lot of different firms can differ, but I got to tell you, if you're you're making a claim for uh, reimbursement in many cases for, for the ransom payment. In many cases, you are going to get a list of questions from the carrier that ask, what are the steps that you went to to ensure that 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 um, recipient was not on the uh, on a sanctions list? And so part of that is working with the negotiator to get to a level of attribution. Um, in one case, we had the negotiator convince the threat actor to actually post something on a blog live so that we could confirm that the person with whom we were communicating actually controlled that blag blog, and then you get to a, a le particular level of, of attribution. Um, and that can help you clear those OFAC concerns. It can help you decide if you want to pay. For example, is this th these ransom negotiators also keep statistics on a particular threat group, whether they've honored their deals in the past 12 to 24 months. And the carriers want to know that information, too, in most cases. And at this point, you should also be thinking about um, whether to contact law enforcement. There's a whole host of considerations that go into that decision. But we've increasingly also seen carriers asking after the fact as part of their own internal OFAC review, whether you contacted law enforcement. Um, adjusters have even asked, did you consult with OFAC counsel and what was the advice? And I find that remarkable because, again, it raises privileged concerns. And Scott and I have had lots of conversations about privilege, when privilege. It is such a murky gray area that I think there needs to be more education of incident response counsel to really understand the bounds of that. I think too many are willing to turn over information that could ultimately lead to greater risk and liability to the underlying client down the road um, in the event of a, you know, enforcement or, or litigation action that may flow from that. Um, I could go on and on, but I feel like that's a good segue to maybe talk about some of the next coverage and, and, and even potentially these privilege issues, Scott, that you and I have talked about many times. Yeah, the, the privilege one is, um, it's challenging to say the least. Uh, and, and here's why. There's two privilege questions at hand. One is, what is privileged as to a claimant, actual or potential? And what is privileged as to your carrier? And how do those intersect? So. As a refresher, because it's fascinating, the attorney client privilege says anything exchanged between the attorney and the client remains privileged and can be considered a work product if you anticipate litigation. And if it's turned over to a third party, then the general rule, of course, it's state specific, but the general rule is that there's a waiver of that privilege unless there's an exception to that rule. 
And so if you are in the spot where uh, your carrier wants information, of course they do, then you say, well, am I waiving privilege by giving it to the carrier? And most states say no if the carrier has accepted coverage or is in the process of investigating. If the carrier says that they've denied coverage, then then a lot of times, again, state specific, so I'm not going to give you a 50 state uh, 50 plus DC treatise right now, but most states say you run the risk if you turn documents over to a carrier that's denied coverage, that you no longer have privilege over those documents. You've waived it because you've given it to a third party with whom your interests are not aligned. Again, not every state says that. There's also a general rule saying that if you give it to your carrier, when the carrier has agreed to cover in full, then again, you're protected. There's the in, quote unquote insurer insured privilege, which means it's, it's really saying that's an exception to the waiver rule. What about the work a day situation where mm -hmm. most claims are not flat out denied? Most claims are not flat out agreed to pay everything in full without any question. The insurer sends a reservation of rights, which says, well, we generally think we'll have to cover. We're investigating. We reserve our rights to deny at any time for the following reasons. Well, then what? Do you have a 100% alignment of interests? A lot of times you do. A lot of times, it, depending upon how the reservation is worded, if it says things like, we won't cover things outside of our policy period, we won't cover if you're in a state that denies coverage for punitive damages, punitive damages, or things like that, a lot of the case law will say that there's no waiver of privilege by sharing with the carrier in that context. On the other hand, if the carrier comes back and says, we barely think this is covered, you're, you're pretty much on your own, but uh, we think that there's a, there's a sliver of a chance that this one thing might, cover, might be covered. Then you're in the spot where you say, okay, well, now what do I do? Because it's a lot more gray. And, and what can I exchange with the carrier? And with ransomware, the, the biggest difficulty is that you're not yet facing, you're not litigating with anybody yet, you're not facing claims yet, you're, you're trying to product. get the yeah. ransom resolved, right? Not yet. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you do? Because it's, it's really easy and clear when a claimant comes, says, uh, serves you with a discovery request saying, give me all the documents you've exchanged with your carrier. Then you and the carrier could sit down and say, maybe we do everything orally and figure things out because we're at risk of turning things over that would harm both of us. But during so we've tried that. And in many cases, the answer is no. I've never been denied a copy of the report. It's really <laughs> challenging. And I, I'm curious, too, this interplay, Michael and Adam both raised this issue of when you have multiple potential policies that are, could respond. And some of those carriers are still sorting out who's going to pay for what. And that also goes into the question of whether you potentially still have common interest or is there a waiver of turning it over? I think there needs to be a, a reckoning almost within the industry to be more cautious. Look, the, the policyholders want to meet their obligations under these policies to cooperate with the carriers. Absolutely. They want to try to come, but you, they also have to be very cautious. And I think as lawyers, it's our responsibility to, to maintain the attorney client privilege and to, to advise appropriately in this area. It's just so challenging given the flux of the law that you you've so well laid out, Scott. Adam, so I think, you... uh, sorry, go ahead, Michael, go ahead. Oh, yeah, very briefly. I mean, these are very complex issues. One thing I would highlight is that the best cyber claims teams have historically always been very proactive in the handling of a claim from discovery you know, to, to closure. But other lines of insurance, that's not always the case. So Scott's notes about, you know, these conversations have to be surfaced extremely early on. I agree with, you know, the, the other thing, and I know that no one weeps for the underwriter, except perhaps the coverage lawyer, <laughs> them. Uh, but we stand in the shoes of these victims and we have paid these claims, you know, uh, the cyber market has paid these claims for the last decade. And uh, it, this is the one area where we are criticized for paying the claims. A lot of our policymakers, uh, a lot of the lawyers who have spoken earlier, you know, the tinge is we want to stop, um, we want to be more involved. We want to raise more regulatory concern. Uh, and, and we want to raise the issue, the systemic issue of what, how does the cyber insurance market plays into this? And so, you know, as we navigate that now in this fulcrum stage in 2021, you know, I think it's important to understand those dynamics too. Great point. Tim, do you want to comment? Yeah, I, um, it's, it's funny. And I was just thinking back to like when we did our prep call for this and I was listening, like there's, there's so many smart people on this panel, right? You have attorneys and all that stuff you're saying, Scott, and, how, and like, and all that stuff is super important. And, su and I'm telling you, 
that there's a lot of people who just don't flat out don't understand that anything that you were just talking about, right? At a client level, when I'm talking to the head of a company, right? Like it's just if I went there with them, they're they're not. It's just not they're they're not going to get it. And I think that's why it's you know it's so important, kind of to what Michael said is is to when you're buying that cyber policy, you're you're kind of buying you're buying it on faith, right? The faith is that when you have an incident, somebody's going to respond to it immediately. Because as you were saying, right, in these other claim scenarios, right, and you talk about other coverage lines too, like, you know, if there's a, if there's a lawsuit that comes in, yes, you need to deal with it promptly and it has to come in, you have to process it, and there's a claims process associated with it. When something locks up all of your systems and all of your computers and nobody can do anything, you need to deal with it right then and there. Right. And so I, at, at that moment, right, the the entire the policy, right, we're talking about like the paper and the coverage and everything at the end of all that discussion. What, what these folks really want to know is when they pick up that phone or click into that incident response app, that the folks on the other end know what they're doing and are going to guide them in the right direction. Right. And, and like you said, understanding what that looks like beforehand super important if you can have that discussion but that's really the whole premise in my mind of like when somebody buys a cyber insurance policy that's what they're getting they're getting that SWAT team that's coming in the window and helping them out because they don't have any idea what they're doing after that so michael continuing this conversation i'd be curious to hear from your perspective and scott from your perspective as well what the carriers are requiring in order to afford coverage well, uh, Scott, do you want to go first or would you like me to? You mean, Jennifer, in terms of buying or in terms of the application or in terms of the claim at the time of claim? The claim. The claim. You, you have a loss. They say they engaged counsel, engaged forensics, made a payment, have restoration costs, uh, data left left their, their house, and they have to do disclosures. So they're sending letters mm-hmm. out, offering credit monitoring to people, need public relations assistance. So those are all the, the typical types of, uh, of fees that we see when we're handling ransomware matters. But talk to me from your perspective about what the carriers are asking for in order to say, your loss is X, here's your check for X. How much time do we have left? Um. <laughs> So what, what I'm finding is that particularly the, the larger, even claims that are not that large, I mean, low seven figures, the, the carriers typically will agree to pay the ransom um, fastest, which is, that's, that's appropriate, right? You, you're, you're rushing to the hospital in an, in an ambulance, like they're not going to say, well, hang on a second. Uh, before we do the emergency surgery, uh, we, we, you know, we're going to take our time and figure things out. I mean, that, that's, where, that's what you need first and fastest. But then after that, then it, it is becoming more detailed and more painful in terms of getting other cost covered. So if you have, if you have lawyers that, that are panel counsel or pre-approved, then that should be pretty straightforward. Uh, if they were not pre-approved, but the carrier says okay to them, uh, you certainly should expect questions, not saying that I think it's appropriate, but based upon experience, carriers say, well, hang on a second, that lawyer charges $7 an hour. We only pay $3 an hour. So you're going to be limited there. Um, and, and gosh, you, you know, you had a laptop that you replaced, but your laptop was three years old and gosh, you got one that's brand new. Well, I don't know. That was a reasonable cost to, to do that. And I'm exaggerating. Obviously, no lawyer is charging $3 an hour, but, but I'm certainly seeing things where there's a question. Was this reasonable? Did you do this? Was this reasonable to do that? Was it, or was it just your opportunity to upgrade your network? I'm seeing that quite a bit. I'm seeing a lot of pushback. I'm seeing carriers hire their own forensic accountants, their own forensic firms overall, and questioning all of the expenses that relate to the, the systems and the, the pieces of, of equipment that were damaged and, and raising questions. Now, now, maybe again, maybe the ones that I don't work on, everything goes great. They hand them a, an invoice and everything gets paid, but I'm pretty suspicious that that doesn't really happen, even for the ones that I'm not involved with. And so that, that's the challenge that my policyholder clients, I know others are facing those questions of, well, why did you spend this? Was it reasonable? And that's kind of the buzzword of, of the day. So if I may, I, I think it's very useful to, to bracket this conversation around the extortion payment itself, where insurers are responding to the increased regulatory attention uh, and the other aspects of, of cyber loss uh, that we're commonly covering. 
So what, where, where uh, my competitors and I do best is in breach response costs. We, we call up uh, uh, August lawyers like the ones on this panel and we get them engaged quite quickly. And we know how to go through the life cycle of a data breach. You know, a lot of my competitors are, and, and I as well, you know, come from a liability focused uh, expertise. And cyber is, a, is this uh, wonderful marriage of first party and third party coverages. So when a ransomware event happens, uh, firms are not only dealing with their breach response, they're not only dealing with a potential lawsuit or regulatory inquiry, they're dealing with a business interruption. And that's where a lot of my competitors and I, you know, we are uh, trying to develop the appropriate first party uh, claims handling practices that would uh, that would ease these concerns, but also make sure that we are disciplined in our measurement of the true loss as compared to uh, what a policyholder uh, may either in, an, in their crisis or for other reason, uh, try to put through their insurance practice. So I think, you know, thinking of the, those three stages, you know, that's that's where I see the state of uh, claims handling certainly um, you know, I endeavor to be the best in my field as do, as do many of my competitors, but, th but that's how I would uh, frame that. So we have eight minutes left. I'd like to turn the discussion to where does cyber insurance go from here, from everybody's perspective? You know, what has the evolution of ransomware over the past few years? I'm not sure anybody could have predicted uh, the uh, the underwriting practices of the past few years. I don't think can continue and carriers are looking to see what they can do differently, not only in the underwriting and policy piece, but also how to help their insurance be better prepared for responding to these events. So why don't we start, Heather, with you? I think you hit the nail on the head that preparation is really everything in key. So that's that's the perspective that I give. I can't say where the insurance market is going to go, but I can say where I think the market for the policyholders is going to go. And that is the your experience in the conduct of a ransomware response is just dramatically influenced by how prepared you are. We offer our clients a break the glass suite of documents that include checklists, playbooks. It's like incident response for dummies where you can just pull off the shelf and follow your checklist of steps um, in the first 24 to 48 hours. And we're seeing that dramatically reducing risk in terms of being able to assert privilege over the investigation, preserve evidence, bring in your your preferred providers having, look, if you're going to put your preferred providers in your checklists, then it's sort of the process of building that checklist means you've gone out and got approval to have those preferred providers on the checklist. So there's a sort of whole op opportunity of, of preparation. But I also think you can't lose sight of, of the close coordination between the legal and compliance teams in-house and also the information security teams. Look, this is, um, these, these are not just IT issues. And I see so many many lawyers in-house who are afraid of technology or afraid of thinking, you know, that's not my, my issue. And I think the more we see lawyers developing cybersecurity skills and technical skills to be able to marry with the, the IT team to really have a holistic approach to information security and understanding, you know, for the, for the legal team to be able to ask, you know, what are we doing for endpoint monitoring? Is there a behavioral analysis? You know, having those kinds of conversations to ensure you're meeting the quote-unquote reasonable security standard that's imposed by so many laws, appropriate security in Europe, so many, so many of these laws around the world. So, you know, I would leave it with, um, uh, you know, preparation is really key and close coordination between the legal and compliance and the information security teams. Yeah, and if risk doesn't fall under legal for whatever reason, making sure they're involved. I know I'm singing, singing from the hymnal of Michael and Adam, but the uh, the approvals that may be necessary to in order to tap into insurance coverage that they have for the incident response process. So we're always telling organizations make sure you got the triangle. Scott, from your perspective, where do we go from here? What's the what's the future going to look like? The the marketplace is changing, and and more. So not only are more companies buying it. Uh, the marketplace is changing what they're willing to offer. And I'm seeing more policyholders pay more attention at the beginning and trying to figure out, well, what am I getting and what will I need to do? So I've had more clients come and want to tabletop items with me and figure out, do they have the right team involved? They have the team involved that they, they know and they like. And will they be able to do what they want to do at the time of the event. And so if you think of, um, I'm stealing the line from a friend of mine, if you think of cyber insurance like an HMO, is my doctor in the plan? And if my doctor's not in the plan, if my lawyer's not approved, if my, if my forensics 
firm is not approved, can I get them approved? Or what do I need to do? Or, or what other things, how do I plan this? How do I make certain that the risk management team and the legal teams are aligned in a way that will be best situated to, to take advantage of this? And also, how is the marketplace changed and what terms and conditions are changed? Will there be, as I was informed earlier, will there be sublimits that I have to be, pay attention to that never existed before? Or will I be situated where another carrier has decided rather than having three different deductibles that can apply, maybe it'll be just one? Or how do I address that? And can I address it? Adam, from your perspective. Yeah, sure. Um, I, you know, I think it's, it's like we, we live it every day. And I think, you know, the way that I look at it, I think that there's, there's a number of different conversations that are, that are being had now, right? And when you look at from a coverage perspective and then from an underwriting perspective, not to steal your thunder, Michael, but, um, you know, I think, you know, a lot of folks are now taking a harder look at how are we going, how are we going to sustain the cyber insurance industry going forward, Right. And as a broker, I understand that, you know, that could mean more scrutiny um, come renewal or when you're right on un underwriting a new piece of business. Right. And then it comes down to what's reasonable to expect a company to do when it comes down to their cybersecurity controls and what they have in place. I think when you look at large, like mega companies that have a ton of money, it's a decision whether or not to invest in certain things, right? And they have the sophistication internally and they have the money to invest. It's a matter of, are they going to do that, right? And then you look at small to mid-sized companies. What can we, what can, how can we help these companies improve their cyber risk posture to a place where we're able to underwrite it? And we're saying, look, you guys are doing the best that you can, but if all of this fails, just know that we have your back. Right. And I think those discussions, those discussions are starting to take place more and more across the board. And I think they have to keep going. Um, and that's the way to build sustainability across, you know, cyber insurance in general. You're up, Michael. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. So, you know, in 2021, the best cyber underwriters are looking to align the economics of cyber insurance and cybersecurity. Cyber risk is one problem. And so we're all going to take a fresh look at and strategic investment in proactive services, uh, technology, security consulting, the kinds of things that Adam was just laying out. So bringing it all together, we have two minutes left. Closing remarks, we'll start with Scott. Well, thinking about your insurance carrier like an HMO, working with them, getting um, permission in advance will make your adjuster most happy. I'm not saying that's the appropriate thing that they need to do, but Making an adjuster happy makes your life a lot easier when you're going through the claim process. And looking at your policies before you need them, as you're buying them, even better. No one likes that, that extra homework. I get it. Uh, I can't always say that I want to eat all my vegetables, but I also recognize that, you know, I'll be much happier and healthier if I do. And similar here with cyber insurance. Heather. Yeah, I think eating vegetables, that's the education piece of this, right, which is, you know, for more of the outside counsel. It's funny, I hear the term breach coach used so often in this, and always I bristle at that language because I say to my clients, like, I'm not going to whisper in your ear and tell you what to do. I'm going to be your quarterback. I'm actually running the incident on your behalf because I view that as my obligation and duty in that role. And so, you know, every different client has different levels of, of sophistication, but from a sophistication standpoint, for the lawyer's part, I think the obligation is to understand those issues of privilege understand when these coverage issues, how they can impact and influence what incident response counsel is doing and the decisions that you're making on the advice you're providing. And so, you know, it, talking to Scott, for example, as coverage issues come up um, and really, uh, you know, continuing to educate yourself on some of those really complex evolving areas is key to, to provide the most effective counsel and advice to your clients going through this crisis. Michael? The cyber insurance sector has to do something different about ransomware than what they've been doing the last few years. Short and sweet, and I couldn't agree. <laughs> Adam, hi cyber. No, I'd say I, I think it's it's great that we're all talking about this. The, the main thing is communication, right? Talk internally about it. Talk with professionals about it, but make sure you understand what you are or are not. And Bruce, I know you're about to kick me off. Just real quick, bringing it all together. Cyber insurance is only part of the solution. There's a real problem with ransomware. It's been evolving over the past few years. It's going to continue. So it requires a lot of 
different organizations and, and people with their own special interests coming together to work on a solution to prepare for responding to these events, uh, to develop possibly some software that may help better defend against these types of events that are working with with everybody that's involved in the, the creation and the implementation and the enforcement of the laws that are that are involved as well and involved in the incident response process when, when the preparation does, isn't enough. Thanks, Bruce. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Great job. Uh, truly a rock star panel here. And I did not make that cuckoo clock sound to kick you off at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, but, but thanks again to the whole panel. You guys are terrific. Uh, our next panel is our second spotlight of the day. It'll be a one-on-one -on -one conversation with uh, Mike Jambrosio of the U.S. Secret Service. So that'll be a good one. And we'll see you back here for that at 125. Thank you.